Hello, hello. We're going to get started in a second. I want to give everyone an opportunity to be notified. Thank you all for coming in on time. Excuse my dog. I'm going to play some music, though. We bless your name. We lift your name high, yeah. We lift your name high, yeah. We lift you high above every other name. We lift you high, high, high. Yes, we lift you high, high, high. Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks. Especially since we're going to be talking about Jesus Christ. So we give God thanks on tonight for sending his only begotten son into this world. That he would be the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. He would willingly give his life, die on the cross, shed his blood, be buried, resurrected, and now ascended into heaven where he now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, 
so that we can have redemption and remission of our sins and access to salvation and eternal life. So, Father, we are grateful and we are thankful. We thank you, Lord God, for your loving kindness to us, word, Father. I pray that on tonight that this will be all of you, none of me. Lord God, anoint these lips, Father. Put your words in my mouth. Holy Spirit, empower every word that comes out of my mouth and the mouth of those who will speak after me, Father. Hallelujah. That the eyes of their understanding will be enlightened and opened to more revelation and truth of your word. And we will walk away with a better understanding of the work of the cross, what the blood of Jesus truly represents and who your son really was and is. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, I pray, amen. All right, we're going to get started. So we were doing a series called The Revelation of Jesus. And I know parts one and two seem like it was forever ago, but I do believe it's now time to finish it out. Now, when I say finish it out, it's not because there's not more that can be delved into as it relates as it relates to who Jesus Christ is. Um, But for the purpose of laying a foundation that will assist you in your studies and in knowing your Savior, I do believe that this next portion, it will be a great segue into whatever teachings come after. I believe that a lot of Revelation and Rhema has been released and given in the multiple parts that after this one, y'all can take it and run with it and God will give y'all the more, okay? And as the Lord so sees fit, if he has me to do another one, then I will. But for right now, guess what? It is finished, just like it was on the cross. So for all those who know me, especially when I'm doing the teaching, I always say have your pens and your paper ready to take notes for what's going to come across. I'm going to be 100. I might be this mellow the whole time because your girl is tired. I'm, I'm exhausted. But this is good. The word of God is good and it's needed. And we're going to get through this, okay? So do me a favor. Just so folks can't say they didn't know that the room was happening, share it once in the hallway for me. I would appreciate it if you would just share it once in the hallway. Um, Because once I get started, you know, folks like to come in on the back end and have a whole bunch to say after they done missed a good portion of the message. And I would prefer for those who need to be here, they will be here as early on as possible. So, again, welcome, and we're about to learn the third part about the Revelation of Jesus, and it's going to deal with the blood of Jesus and the work of the cross, okay? So, we're going to start with, hold on, let me just sit up. Maybe I'm a little too comfortable. Is y'all comfortable where y'all are? (sighs) I hope y'all comfortable. I was a little too comfortable. All right. (laughs) So, we're going to start with 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. Now, bear with me. It may seem like we're jumping, but it's strategic, okay? I'm going to give it to you how the Lord showed it to me. And I know how y'all do me, so I know that for the good portion, this will not be interactive. Y'all just going to be listening because y'all say y'all be taking it in. So, I got you. I'm going to just talk, okay, until I can't talk no more and I'm done. So 1 John chapter 1, verse 7 highlights and shows us um, how the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So therefore, that gives us an indicator that sin stains us, okay? Okay. Sin leaves a mark, okay? Just like you can go outside and play in the in the mud and get mud on your clothes and your mother know where you was at. You was outside in the mud, wasn't you? Because it's evidence of what you were doing. 
sin stains us and it's evidence of what we have been doing, whether in the light or the darkness, with the lights on or off. It speaks. It, it's a snitch. It tells, okay? Um, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from that sin. So it's like uh, either putting on a new garment or your clothes being washed, okay? So the blood of Jesus cleanses us from sin. All right, let's keep going. Next, we have Matthew chapter 26, 28. And again, follow along with me. I know this may seem foundational, but you know how God does. He lays the foundation. And as we begin to build up, it'd be like, oh, that's deep. So with the blood of Jesus, we have remission of sins. Four, this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Well, what is remission? That means the pardon, deliverance, liberty, forgiveness. When you look it up in Strong's, those are uh, the, the definitions that go into composing up what remission of sins means in Matthew 26, 28. That means that your sin gets excused. That means that your sin, you know, gets forgiven. That means that you get free, freed from the bonds of that sin. You get freed from whatever came attached to that sin. So we have a cleansing that happens. We have a freedom that happens. We have a forgiveness that happens. Because guess what? For the blood of Jesus to cleanse and to forgive, that means that the sin is exposed before the Savior. And the Savior steps in, and we'll see how he's the mediator of a better covenant, but he steps in and says, listen, before you even try to go in front of my father, he see all that, he's automatically going to judge because he is the judge. I'm going to clean you up, okay? You said that you're sorry, you're repenting, had a lifestyle change, great clean you up. I'm going to forgive you. I'm going to pardon you from what came with the sin. And I'm going to clean you up real good so that it's not going to be there no more. Have y'all ever tried to Clorox a white shirt that has a stain on it? And even with the bleach, you can kind of still tell that there's still stuff in the fibers that gave way that something spilled on you. Well, when Jesus cleanses us from our sins, there is no evidence left. There is nothing there that can be pointed to or be rerouted to to show that that was ever attached to you. All right, that right there is enough. Y'all should give the Father praise. When you think about all the stuff that you did and when you finally repented, guess what? It no longer was a reflection before the Father or the Savior because Jesus took care of it. His blood cleansed it all. That right there should have give you another level of gratefulness on today. So Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says that and almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Now listen, y'all can read the whole chapter. Y'all can read the, the verse before and the verse after before. The context and timing of why we are in here. I'm giving you the scripture so that in your own private study, y'all can do the more. All right? Now, if the blood purges, right, hear me, flow with me, and it says, and almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission, that means that there's more to the blood of Jesus than what you may think. Because if without it, there's no forgiveness, and if the law can only be purged with it, what exactly is in the blood? What exactly comes with the atonement of the blood? Now, remission here has the same meaning as remission um, in Matthew 26, 28. So we're still talking about forgiveness, deliverance, liberty, pardoning. So I want y'all to, to keep that thought in your mind about the more as it relates to the blood, because if the law can only be purged by blood, 
that says no matter how much work you do, no matter how good of a person you are, no matter how well you can talk, you can be the best orator in the world, no matter how smart you are, the law cannot be purged. The law cannot be subjected to anything other than what? The blood. That is why in the Old Testament, there was, before Christ shed his blood, it was the blood of animals that was used. So there is power in the blood, and we'll understand why and what that power is in a second. But it is important to note that where there is no shedding of blood, there is no purging of the law. And where there is shedding of blood, we are now talking about contracts and covenants. Because within law, every law is pertinent to a covenant and a contract. Every law is inclusive in a covenant or a contract. The Constitution is a covenant, is a contract. Those laws that make up the Constitution make up that contract. Uh oh. Keep that on your mind. So now we have First John. I'm giving y'all scriptures if y'all want to put them in the chat. Do what y'all do. We have First John chapter 2, verse 2. And it talks about, and he is their propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Not even just part of the world, the whole world. Now, that says that the whole world has access to remission and redemption of sins if they what? If they accept Christ. But if they don't, guess what? They miss out on their biggest blessing. And when we look at what propiti propitiation means, it means atonement. So like in the Old Testament where they would present the bulls and present the, the animal sacrifices for the atonement or the forgiveness of sins, that is what Jesus did for us individually and for the world as a whole. Okay? So that means everyone that God created and keyword that God created has access to it, but it doesn't mean that they will accept it. Okay. Now we're gonna get a little deeper. So we're gonna go to Revelations chapter one, verse five. We're talking about the blood of Jesus and how it is finished with the blood, the work of the cross, and what the blood really did. So now we have Revelation chapter one, verse five. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness. Hold on, first of all, at Add this to your list of characteristics of your Savior. He is a witness. And he bears witness. So when we talk about, you know, and the Bible talks about a cloud of witnesses. And we talk about the, the courtroom of the Ancient of Days. And we talk about, you know, testimonies. You know, we have witnesses who are bearing testimony on our behalf. It says right here that Jesus, who is the faithful witness. So Jesus witnesses. Jesus is a witness to the fact that what? That you've repented, you renounced, and you have been cleansed. You have been redeemed. Your sins have been pardoned. You are now free. Jesus is a witness to your decision. So when the accuser of the brethren presents himself, the mediator of the better covenant, our counselor, our lawyer, the one who makes intercession for us, has the ability to stand before the Father, because don't forget he sits at his right hand, right? He has the ability to stand and go before the Father and say, I witnessed. Uh-oh. I don't know if y'all know what that means. I need y'all to understand. Jesus Christ is a faithful witness on your behalf every time. Like, no, they're not dirty. I witnessed them being cleaned up. No, no, no. I witnessed them changing. 
No, no, no. I witnessed their repentance. No, no, no. I witnessed the purging of the law with the blood. No, no, no. I witnessed. Uh-oh. Okay. So he is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. And we're going to get back to what his death did. And the prince of the kings of the earth. We're going to pause for a second. Did y'all know that Jesus Christ, put this on your characteristic list, that he is the prince of the kings of the earth? We knew he was the prince of peace. Mm -hmm. We knew he was the redeemer. We knew he was our, our inter he intercedes on our behalf. But did you know that he was the prince of all the kings of the earth? So when we talk about that God is king of kings and Lord of lords, and Jesus Christ is the son of God, so then automatically based on hierarchy in the kingdom, Jesus Christ is the prince of the kings because his father is what? The king of the kings. Now we're talking about authority, we're talking about ranking, and we're talking about ruling. All right. And it goes on to say, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. So when your sins are being washed, Jesus Christ is literally cleansing you himself with his blood. Every from the from the first drop that was shed to the last. You're being cleansed. By Jesus Christ and his blood. And that cleansing is purifying. It's purging you from the law. It is remitting your sins. It is atoning you. So every time you say, Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins. You're being washed. Now, if you say it and you don't mean it, you're not being washed. You're still staying with the sin. Why? Because Jesus is no dummy. God is no dummy. The Holy Spirit is no dummy. They know when you are serious and when you are just doing lip service. How, how, how do you know when you're doing lip service? Because you'll repent today and or you'll repent tonight and then tomorrow morning you'll go back and do the same thing. There are fruits of repentance that are born that the moment you settle it in your heart, hear me, because the Holy Spirit searches all things, yea, even the deep things concerning you. So the moment you repent, the Holy Spirit goes to do his job and begins to search. Did they mean it? What's in their heart? Is there still a desire or is there still an intention to do this later? Is it still in them to to go out and, and to repeat the same thing two seconds after, you know, the repentance leaves their lips. And based off of what is found doing that search, you know what it's like? What it's like is, you know, how they have a warrant and they say, I have a warrant now to search your home, to pull out anything that can be used as evidence or that is needed um, because we're looking for something. So now the Holy Spirit has a warrant to go in and to pull out anything to show whether or not, yeah, this repentance is real or not. And based off that search warrant, guess what? Depends upon whether you really meant your, that I repent, I'm sorry. And then you're ready to be cleansed or you, Jesus Christ ain't paying you no mind. Because true repentance comes with what? With change. Okay. So. Now, we have Revelations 1-5. We know that Jesus is washing us with his blood. So we're going to skip to Hebrews 13 and 20. So we have some new characteristics to put in, in the our Savior category. We have some new characteristics to put in uh, what the blood of Jesus does. Okay. Now, based off of Hebrews 13 20, now the God of peace, uh-oh, See that again? We're talking about hierarchy. You know, in a kingdom, there it is a monarchy in the kingdom of God. 
And if Jesus is the Prince of Peace, then God is what? He he he's the King of Peace. He 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 is peace. Oh, I hope y'all get that. Now the God of Peace, that brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus, that great Shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant. So the blood of Jesus is literally a covenant. I'm going to say it again. I need y'all to understand that. The blood of Jesus is literally a covenant. It is a contract between you and the Father. You're saying, when you cleanse me with your blood, I agree to follow the bounds and the confines of the contract of the kingdom, what is requested of me, what is needed of me, what I'm called to do, what you want me to do, I'm going to do it. I'm going to abide by the contract. So in the contract, God lists what he will do and he lists what's required of you to do. He He's saying, you do this, I do this. You do that, I do that. Within the contract. So foundationally, the blood of Jesus is your contract signed and sealed in blood between you and the Father. Now, just like at work, they got a grace period so that you're supposed to be there at 8, but if you get there at 8.05, 8.10. But if you get there at 8.11, now they docking your time. Some jobs don't even have a grace period. But with the Father, now you have grace and mercy, right? Now, should grace and mercy continue to abound so that you can sin, so that you can breach covenant, so that you can violate the holiness of the shed blood, so that you can break the seal of the contract between you and the Father, the blood seal? No, I think not. But what the Father did was he wrote in the contract a measure of grace. Because he understands that, listen, y'all live in a, a world that is very enticing. And I understand that the enemy of your soul can be very seducing. So I'm going to write in my grace and my mercy, lest you fall short of any provision. Because without it, not only do you break the covenant, but you come out of covenant. And when you come out of covenant, God is no longer bound to the contract. When you breach the contract, the contract is now voided on your end. And God is no longer bound to the contract, to the covenant, because you broke it first. See, when the Bible talks about that God is a covenant-keeping God, that means that in no way, shape, or form will he ever go against his covenant. Will he ever go against his word? Will he ever go against his promises to you? So the only way to break covenant is on your end. You're the only one that can break covenant with the Father because he never will break covenant with you. And when you do, he wrote in grace and mercy. He said, listen, all right, I got, here's the thing. You don't, you don't know how much grace and mercy is written in for you though. The measure of grace that may be on Brigitte might not be the measure of grace that may be on me to slip up, to fall, to, to have a hiccup. So that's why it is better not to break covenant than to intentionally do it. Because you think grace and mercy going to cover you forever. Because that's not the case. So I'm going to say this again. The blood of Jesus Christ is a covenant. With covenant and contract. Hear me. So you have two terms I'm throwing out. Let me make it a bit clearer. So the contract is what's enforceable. Okay, and a covenant is enforceable 
is enforceable within the contract because it's like a part of the clauses. Okay. The covenant is a part of the contract. So the Bible is like a book of law. All right. That is the contract. The covenant in the contract that binds you to the father and the father to you is your acceptance of the work of the cross in the blood of Jesus. Okay. So with contracts comes a certain level of authority and power. And I say a certain level. Why? Because the, you don't have power to go outside that you don't have power over anything outside of the contract. So I have a contract for my home, I've got a mortgage. I don't have power over my neighbor's mortgage. I don't have power over my other neighbor's house. The power that I have lies within the bounds of the contract that I am in. I don't have authority over my neighbor's property. I don't have authority over the grocery store because I don't own it. I have authority over my property because that's where the contract is. Okay. I'm laying the groundwork. All right. I'm laying the groundwork. So now we're talking about how the blood of Jesus is a contract. There was a covenant that we came into when we accepted the work of the cross and the shed blood and the blood seals the contract. Let me tell you, every contract has to be signed in blood. I don't care if it's for the kingdom of darkness or the kingdom of God. In the spiritual realm, contracts are only enforceable by blood. Laws can only be purged by what? By blood. Uh-oh. So if you and your dreams and something's trying to prick your finger, something is trying to get you to sign in blood. And we know what that something is. There's power in the blood. The blood is a sealer of the deal. That's why we should not carelessly or recklessly shed blood. And we should be careful even when we have minor accidents and our blood is shed. Okay. Because without a signed contract in blood, it's not enforceable. And the law is not purged. Okay. All right. Let's keep going. So we have Acts chapter 20, verses 28. Take heed unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. All right. Now we get a little deeper. Y'all ready? So we know that um, contracts are enforceable and um, signed in blood. And now I want you to understand that the blood of Jesus purchased you. It acquired you. It bought you. So blood is a transactionary means of measure. Where there is blood, there is a transaction. Where there is blood, there is a transaction. That is why when the Bible talks about you can't serve God and mammon, okay? That is why when the Bible talks about how you must choose one, mammon is the transactionary measure of this earth realm, okay? If Jesus Christ already bought us, you can't use a carnal, earthly, demonically influenced currency to move the Father, when it was by the blood of his son that he bought you. So faith is the currency, but transactions are made in blood. When those, the ages in the kingdom of darkness, witches, warlocks, sorcerers, those who do these, who do altar work, and they begin to present sacrifices 
before it's all said and done. They, the, the, the spirits may let them begin with a leaf or some grain or, you know, a feather. I'm just being exaggerating. But before it's all said and done, they're going to have to offer up some blood of an animal first, then maybe of themselves, and then from somebody else. That is why Planned Parenthood is such a big institution in the United States because those fetuses get sold. The blood that is shed, the table that the person lays on now becomes an altar. The blood that is shed now becomes a sacrifice. And there are covenants that are came into and the contracts are established and sealed with blood. So there's a carefulness because if you understand the value of the blood, see when Jesus got on the cross, that was just a step. It wasn't until his blood was shed that the transaction took place. The moment his blood was shed, every debt that was related to God's creation, man, that God created man, Hear me, I said, man, that God created, okay. Um, that transaction, that debt was paid. So now anything you owed or your ancestors owed to the kingdom of darkness, where Satan was trying to hold a bounty over your head, all you had to do was go to the bank. Uh-oh. All you had to do was go to the Savior, and he had already made enough of a deposit for you to withdraw whatever you needed to remove, disannul, be pardoned from, be free from, be forgiven from, be delivered from anything relating to the kingdom of darkness. So we know now that the blood is a transactionary means of measure. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 17 and 11, and we're going to get some more understanding. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. You don't have no blood in your body, you did. You think when you lose your breath, you did. No, you don't have no blood in your body, you did. Because the life of the flesh is in the blood. So when Jesus Christ died, the life that was in his blood now became life accessible to y'all. Well, I hope you get that. I came so that you can have life and life what? More abundantly. So that abundant life was a part of the, 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 the blood that was shed on the cross because within Christ's flesh, that blood... There was life in the blood. So for every drop that fell, that was life that was now extended to y'all so you could have eternal life. An extension to your life. Abundant life. Wherever you were lacking in your blood, he made up the difference. So where... Salvation would only be for the Jews. Now it can be for the Gentiles. Because the blood of Jesus came in and brought life to dead places. Brought life to places, to, 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 to bloodlines that would otherwise not be counted in. It cleansed their blood, purified it. It removed, okay. Okay. So... I was anemic and I was anemic to the point where I would have to get blood transfusions, right? So that meant that I would have to sit in a chair and someone else's blood would have to get pumped into my arm so that I could live. My count was under three. Okay. I think the count had to be 12 and up. Mine was under three. And if I did not have this blood being pumped into me, and assisting my blood cells to regenerate and to get to the levels that it needed, I would have died. Okay. 
So what Jesus did was, and the way his blood works is that it makes up for where yours is lacking. It cleanses your bloodline. It cleanses your blood. It purifies you. Anything that the enemy has sought to taint you with in your blood, the blood of Jesus comes in and does a work to purify it. And so guess what? We know that because of the fall of man, because of the fall of the angels, that there's a tainted bloodline. If ever. Uh-oh. I'm going to let y'all think about that. Think about that, y'all. So, let's keep going. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your sins. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Now we talk about, I just want to, I need you to save your soul. I just want to save your soul, your soul, your soul, your soul. It is the blood of Jesus that makes atonement for your soul. So, I want you to think about this. What was the altar? If the blood is the atonement, and the atonements, they cancel, they cleanse, they disannul, they pardon, they purge, and they placate. Um, what was the altar? The cross. The cross was the altar that Jesus Christ was laid upon. And he hung on that cross and shed his blood. His blood was the sacrifice. And we're going to go a bit deeper to that in a second. And what it did was any other covenant or contract that you may have been in, it canceled it. It gave you power through your acceptance, through your faith to cancel to be pardoned from any prison, to disannul, to avoid any contract or any agreement that you were in with the kingdom of darkness that would keep you from being in relationship with the Father. So now we have Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Let me go here real quick. Hold on, y'all. I got to find my books. You ever have so many windows up and you're trying to find the one that's relevant? Where's my Hebrews? All right. Here we go. Hebrews chapter 10. Y'all know I like my KJV. I don't care what y'all think about it. Now, we're going to start. I said I should read all of it. Let's see. Let's just start in verse 1. All right, because we, we lay in this foundation of the blood. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. So, you have the law, and you have the fact that no matter how much they tried, no matter how much they sacrificed, it was never going to be enough for them to be perfect enough to be righteous and in right standing with the Father and to have a personal relationship with Him. There was always going to be something that was going to be staining their garment. There was always going to be a sin that was going to be there that would stain them in the presence of the Father, okay? For then would they not have ceased to be offered? So they ask the question. I mean, because if the offerings was enough, wouldn't they have to stop offering at some point? If the offerings was enough for their sins to be forgiven? Because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. Meaning that after you didn't did the sacrifice, that should have been it. Like you, your, your sin consciousness, your ability to do sin should have been burnt up with it, right? But that wasn't the case. People were just offering up these offerings and still going out there and, and sinning and, and, and then, you know, submitting more offerings. There was no consciousness, okay? There was no conviction, okay, for what they were doing to the point of them not doing it no more. Because it was harder for them to be in relationship because the sin kept itself, it kept them stained 
dirty with the father. But in those sacrifices, there's a remembrance again of sins every year. So again, every year, them sins. Remembrance means it was something that happened before that's coming to you remember. So it was happening over and over and over again. Year after year, these sins were being presented back to the Father. So God then, you know, forgave you of one thing. Now you back again about the same thing. Well, didn't I just forgive you of that? But here you are again, year after year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. The blood of bulls and goats, although they were considered acceptable for offering, was not enough, was not pure enough, could not cleanse enough, could not do what the blood of Jesus did. Wherefore? When he cometh into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. So what God did is he prepared a body. See, the animal sacrifices wasn't good enough. It had to be a human blood sacrifice that was made that would be able to cleanse the whole world of their sins if they should come into repentance and accept the Savior. So God prepared a body for Jesus and burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin. Thou hast had no pleasure. God got tired of him. Like, listen, ain't nothing changing. You ain't got no consciousness of your sin. You keep doing the same thing over and over again. I'm going to do something else. Then said, I, lo, I, come in the volume of the book that it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Well... Again, who is Jesus? Jesus Christ is not only the, the son of God, but he is the word of God. And the word of God became flesh so that it could be a sacrifice to release folks from the bondage of their sins. The only way the word of God could complete and perform on that level was if it took on a fleshly body. And a fleshly body is not alive without blood. Because blood gives what? Life to the flesh. So God sent his word to become flesh. So that was the real, that was not even the real, that was that was one of the, the highlights of the performance of Jesus as the word of God. When he went forth and, and was created into a, a, a man from a spirit. So with that, in verse 8 it says, Above when he says, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, Thou would have not, neither had his pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. So he took away the first, which was the offerings that were being given in the Old Testament, for the second, which was the ultimate offering, which was a better sacrifice and a mediator of the better covenant for the people by which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all so now with Jesus Christ offering up his body we can be sanctified once and for all because beforehand we were not sanctified beforehand we were still walking away stained and blemished but this way we are sanctified and every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. See, don't forget that part. We're going to come back to the fact, it's going to be important, y'all, that he sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies to be made his footstool. 
For by one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. With the offering of the bulls and the animals, there was no perfection. The only perfection came through the offering of Jesus Christ and the shedding of his blood. Wherefore, the Holy Ghost also is as is. I'm sorry. Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Now, for all those who are learning about biblical scripting with me, you cannot tell me scripting is not important if god is saying he's going to write his law he didn't say i'm gonna just place him he said i'm going to write he's going to inscribe his law in where your mind there was power in writing oh lord oh lord oh lord and he put his laws in our hearts and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now, where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. See, we couldn't even make it into the holy of holies without the blood sacrifice. But now we don't even need a, the priest to go and offer before on our behalf because with the blood of Jesus we have access on our own because he was the ultimate sacrifice and because he is the redeemer of our sins we on our own without a, 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 a man a man that is in the priest um, can go and get um, remission and redemption of our sins directly. All right. And we have the ability to enter into the Holy of Holies. Now, not everybody who say they've been in there has been in there, but we have the ability by the blood of Jesus because we can be cleansed to a point where we can enter into the presence of the Father on his throne. Uh-oh. Not everybody there, though. That's a lot of cleansing. By a new way and living way, which he has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And having a high priest over the house of God. So he is now the high priest. We don't have to go to like the Levitical priesthood like back in the day and bring them the calf. No, Jesus is our high priest. Put that in your characteristics of the Savior. He is the high priest because he was the he was the one who offered the ultimate sacrifice. That after him, no more sacrifices were needed. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promise. Now listen, I'm going to keep going down. I'm going to skip to verse 28. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Can I tell you that there are witnesses that bear witness on your behalf? The Holy Spirit is one. It says Jesus is a faithful witness. It also talks about the cloud of witnesses. Do you know that also that the angels will bear witness? Because there, there are watchers here in this earth realm, some who have been assigned to you directly. Because when someone comes to you and accuses somebody of something, Hear me. Say someone came to me and said, well, most said da 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 Most stole your da 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 Now, I could just take that person's word and go to Mo. Mo, you stole this, and this is your... But where there are witnesses, let's say Mo didn't steal that. Mo didn't do that. Mo wasn't even there. Then the accuser of the brethren is shown to be the liar that he is. Oh. I'm going to let y'all sit with that. Verse 29. 
Oh, how much sore punishment, suppose ye, shall he be thought worthy, who have trodden under the foot of the Son of God, who have counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. So the blood covenant sanctified you from being unholy and gave you the ability to be holy. The blood of Jesus sanctifies. Hmm. So be ye holy as I am holy. How? Through the blood of Jesus. Through the remission of sins. Through the washing, the cleansing that the, the blood of Jesus does. Now, let's go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 24. We are learning about what the blood of Jesus is and what it does. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. It does what? It speaketh better things. So the blood speaks. The blood speaks. So in Genesis, it says, Genesis 4.10, the voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Every time you shed blood out of your body, its voice is released in this earth realm and it begins to speak and tell a story. I don't care if you pricked it on a safety pin. I don't care if you you, you were hammering a nail and, and you, you pricked it on a nail. I don't care if you got a paper cut and it drew blood. The moment that blood was released out of your body, it began to speak a story regarding you. Ladies, you bleed every month? Your menstrual? Is that not blood? Every drop that you release is speaking a narrative. Anytime blood leaves your body, its voice is activated. Blood is not dead. Blood is alive. Blood is the life of the flesh. So when we talk about Jesus being the mediator and he's bearing witness for you, the Holy Spirit is now bearing witness. We got the angels bearing witness. And now the blood that was shed. Your blood is bearing witness. The blood of sprinkling, the blood of Jesus is bearing witness. So we have all these voices now that are bombarding heaven. Uh-oh. So when the kingdom of darkness is stating its case, your blood is on the stand. Any blood that you shed is on the stand. The blood of Jesus is on the stand. Y'all ever seen Law and Order and all them shows that show you like the, the courtroom and you had a lawyer? So the lawyer is the mediator. Lawyer is the counselor, okay? That's Jesus. He's the one saying, Your Honor, I would like to present this, this, and this on today. I would like to call my first witness, which is my blood. And the blood gets on the stand and begins to testify. I cleanse Cookie on August the 2nd at 8.02 p.m. when she repented of this, this, and this. I blotted out this sin. It's been, it's gone. There's nothing there. So anything that the enemy is saying as evidence is inadmissible because it no longer exists. Well, Your Honor, I would like to put her angel on the stand. Yeah, Your Honor, I was there. You sent me and assigned me to be her watcher and on the date that the accuser is saying that she did, that she wasn't even in the vicinity. Um, the enemy is not being um, forthright. Um, 
you know, blah, 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 blah. I would like to present the Holy Spirit to testify. Your Honor, I reside with inside the vessel of cookie and I've searched her heart and the things that the enemy has said was in her heart are not in there. Um, and I testify that this is the truth. I hope y'all getting this because blood is not just blood. These veins that you see in your body and the life force that is pumping through them, they literally have a voice. So when you cut your arm and you're a cutter, the blood is speaking against you. It's no longer speaking for you. It's speaking against you. Lord, they're shedding me prematurely. Lord, they're hurting themselves. Lord, they're creating covenants. Lord, Lord, Lord. Come on now. So just like the blood of Abel, when it was spilled, spoke from the ground, why wouldn't your blood speak? The blood of your womb. Father, I was in the womb. I'm going to need you to remove any barrenness. Father, this is going on. That's going on. I need you to heal the lining. I need you to remove the fibroid. I need you to, that there's some stuff going on in there. Don't just think because it's coming out that end that, that it that it don't have no voice. Okay. I'm trying to help y'all. So y'all stop praying and missing. You really understand the blood of Jesus and the power of the blood. So let's do this. The blood of Jesus does not ward off demons. You can plead the blood of Jesus all day, but it doesn't mean a demon won't try you. And for those who say, well, pleading the blood of Jesus is not biblical. Well, it works. Why? Because you're literally stating an argument when you plead your case. So pleading the blood of Jesus is saying, I need the blood of Jesus to get on the stand on my behalf. And to argue and testify in regards to me. Okay. So when people try to make you feel bad, you say, I plead the blood, I pled the blood of Jesus. Don't feel bad. Because had you not pled the blood of Jesus, then who knows when he would have took the stand. He had to get on the stand sooner than later. And say, Father, that thing down there trying to get your daughter, down there trying to trip up your son, that, that incubus and succubus is trying to establish a covenant, but they already in covenant. Father, I need you to look down what's going on. Father, I testify. I see it. That This is what they trying to do. I'm going to need you to judge on their behalf. You're a righteous judge. Father. So pleading the blood of Jesus does work. It's literally the blood of Jesus arguing and speaking on your behalf about the covenant that you are in. Now, the blood of Jesus does not ward off demons. It does not keep you demon it does not keep demons away from you. It is not a repellent for demons. What is the blood of Jesus? It's a contract. Doesn't mean that the enemy won't try it. Especially if, guess what? He feels he got one, too. I got a contract, too. Great-grandma Sally then said I could have her. And she signed it in her blood. And, yeah, she in contract with you, but she didn't apply that contract to cancel this one. So mine is still in effect. So she belonged to me. Uh, Okay. Yeah, I don't think that that's possible. All right. You ever seen two folks married to the same man? I'm married to him. No, I'm married to him. Well, I got a marriage license. Well, I got a marriage license. No. Okay. Okay. So what has to happen is this. 
what the blood of Jesus is in this instance, it is a reminder of the covenant and of the debt that's paid. It's like a receipt. When I'm applying the blood of Jesus, I am showing the receipt for payment. This has already been paid in full based off of this contract. So you no longer have jurisdiction or authority as it relates to this because your contract is now disannulled. Every provision in your contract has been cured by this one. As it is in spiritual, so it is in the natural. And to understand even the foundations of law, I want you to understand that there can be multiple, you can have multiple contracts open. And then you can enter into one that would handle or take care of all of them. But if you never notify, it's the same thing with bankruptcy. You can be discharged in bankruptcy for things, but if they're never notified that it was covered in the bankruptcy, they're still going to pursue you for it. Oh, that was good, whether y'all want to admit it or not. So you can have your car, your house, your credit cards, all covered under the bankruptcy and discharged where you owe no money. You have a clean slate. But if the creditor is never notified, they're still operating under the provision of the contract that they had because they don't know that it's been voided and pursuing you for something that was already paid for. Do y'all see that? Do y'all see that? So Christ, when you came into covenant, paid for it. Now you need to notify your creditors that it has been discharged. It has been canceled. It has been disannulled. It has been purged. You have been pardoned. It has been atoned. You are free from those contracts. If you don't notify your creditors, they still feel justified in their pursuit. That is why some of y'all are still being pursued by things on your bloodline because you've never notified them. All of this was cleared and covered in the bankruptcy. All of this was cleared and covered when Jesus Christ shed his blood and, and I came in covenant. So the blood of Jesus is your authoritative papers to present, right? The contract to show that this was purchased. That's where you get your authority and your power from, level one. Level one. You have authority through the covenant. You have authority through the contract. You have authority through the blood. And in that authority, you have power. You have the power to say, I'm not paying that because I don't owe it. You have the power to say, you can't have my son because he doesn't belong to you. You have the power to say, give me my stuff back because you stole it. You have authority and power through that covenant now to begin to speak Come on, y'all. I know how y'all do me. It's okay. Now, there are different types of offerings listed in the Old Testament. There's like the burnt offering, the grain offering, the fellowship offering, the sin offering. You know, even under the sin offering, you know, offerings have been made for sins, that, unintentional sins. Sins that you didn't even realize you was committing. But once you realized it, you had to do an offering. Or just in case you sin you had to do an offering right so when jesus christ died on the cross guess what all of those offerings got merged into the one where now the only one you have to go through and ask for atonement and forgiveness is the savior so i had to notice that i've been skipping steps sometimes when i pray because i've just been so programmed be like lord god forgive me well, forgiveness comes through what? Cleansing of what? The sins by what? The blood of Jesus. So 
It really is, Lord Jesus, forgive me and cleanse me with your blood. Because you can't even get to God without that sin being judged in his presence. Oh, we talking protocol now. We talking protocol now, y'all. It cleanses. Without it cleansing, you're dirty. And being dirty, you cannot enter into the presence of the king. So when you are seeking for forgiveness and are repenting, your repentance should go through Jesus Christ, who is the mediator, who is the, the one who, who established the covenant. It is his blood. You ask him to forgive you, and he is the one who washes you in his blood and removes the stain of the sin. We can't skip steps no more. See, grace covered us for what we didn't know, but when we know better, we got to do better. So when you are repenting, your repentance goes to the Savior. Because he has to clean you up before you can even go to the Father and request anything from him. All right, we got that. Now, oh, now this is going to be good. All right. Now, we're going to go to Colossians. We're going to go to Colossians. Where's my Colossians? Yes, Colossians. I love it. I love it. Hold on, y'all. Y'all know I got like 50 million windows open from all these scriptures. I'm about to close a couple. Is this Colossians right here? Here we go. We're going to go to 1 Colossians. Chapter, no, it's Second Colossians. See, I be writing stuff wrong. Second Colossians chapter 2, and we're going to go verse 6 to 15. Okay. This is going to be good, y'all. This is going to help y'all be free from the enemy. Because if you understand what the blood really is, you'll stop misapplying it. Okay. So starting in verse 6. As ye have therefore received... Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. Rooted, where are your roots supposed to be? In Jesus, and built up in, in who? In Jesus. And established in the faith, as ye have been taught, ab abounding therein with thanksgiving. Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy, and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. We got to be careful of these traditions and, you know, these great orators who talk and everything but ain't saying nothing. For in him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Uh-oh. It's this right here, y'all. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. See, now this is going to go back to, for those who've been following all the angels and demons teaching. Y'all need to write this down in the characteristics of your Savior. He is the head. I don't care what principality it is, whether it's evil or it's holy. He is the head of principality and power. He is the head of it. He is over. He has, he has authority over. He has jurisdiction over every principality, good or evil, and every power, good or evil. And I'm going to go back to the angels teaching, and I'm going to give you all a tidbit because I'm like, oh, that's good. Because when you understand your authority and when you understand what the blood does, then, you know, you're, you're less inclined to be so moved sometimes, right, when the enemy tries it. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, and pitting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism. So why do you need to be baptized? It is indicative of a spiritual death. You are dying to the old man. It is comparable to death. You're not going to bury someone who's not what? Dead. So the water is like your grave. It's like you're back in the womb again. 
before you were born into this earth and you breathed this air. So you're buried with him in baptism. So baptism is needed. It's a part of your salvation. It's a step in your salvation. Wherein also ye are risen with him, because when you come up out of the water, it is indicative of the resurrection. When he rose with what? All power, didn't he? Through the faith of the operation of God, who have raised him from the dead. So when the Bible talks about you have to be born again, the baptism is the step in your salvation where you are now dying to the old man and rising, being resurrected into the kingdom of God. You're dying to this world. You're dying to your flesh. You're dying to all of those things. And now you're being washed, cleansed, and resurrected into the kingdom of God. When you come up, it's like you're being raised from the dead. That's why baptism is important. Hold on, y'all. I got... Give me one second. Thank you. All right. Now, and you being dead in your sin. So when you are sinning, you're literally spiritually dead. And the uncircumcision of your flesh hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you you all trespasses. So not only are you forgiven of your sins, but you're forgiven of trespassing. What happens when you trespass? You are outside of your bounds of authority. You are in a place where you don't have authority or permission to be. So every time you have walked outside of your bounds of authority, every time you have walked outside of where you were supposed to be, you trespass against the Father. And in being baptized, you're forgiven for your trespasses and you're being resurrected and cleansed of your sins. Now, here's the thing. 14, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us. Here we go with the handwriting again. The scripting. The writing. See, y'all going to let these new age folks take away your ability to understand biblical scripting where they want to write their manifestations 33 by 33 and this, this, and this and assign a spirit to it. Whereas if God is going to write and scribe onto your mind, didn't he say that he's going to scribe his, he's going to hide your, his law. No, he was going to scribe it in your mind. Why well, not the scripture? And hide the law in your heart. I just read it to y'all. That's on here. Mm-hmm. And now we got the father talking about blotting out the writing. Reversing some things that have been written against you which was contrary to us and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. That's why we ain't got to worry about spells, hexes, and curses. That's why your incantations don't matter. Because when Jesus nailed it to the cross, he took authority over it forever. Forever. That's why we don't worry about the witches. That's why we don't worry about what people are writing or saying it was nailed to the cross. And Jesus took authority over it forever. Now, if Jesus has authority over it, then that authority also got transferred to who? To us. So when you are praying against these spells... You need to blot out every handwriting that has been written against you, every spell, every hex, every curse, and nail it to the cross. Uh Uh-oh. Nail it where? To the cross. See, that's an altar, right? That was the altar that Jesus was sacrificed on where his blood was shed, and his blood is continually speaking a better what? Okay. 
So if you're going to nail it to the altar where the blood is that's speaking on your behalf, anything that's speaking against you, and the blood does what? See, the blood cleanses and erases, right? So if the word says it's blotting out the handwriting, when you nail that spell or that curse to the cross, every handwriting, every script, every accusation gets what? Blotted out. Because there's what on that altar? Because the cross is the altar, right? There's the blood of Jesus. Oh, I hope y'all got that. Y'all be less inclined to be worried now. And y'all be more empowered to know what to do about some of the things you've been experiencing in your life. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly triumphing over them in it. So here we go again about the principalities and powers. Hmm. First of all, he's the head, according to first, Second Colossians, of principalities and powers, and now he has embarrassed them. He showed out and showed off. He showed out and showed, he spoiled them. He made a spoil of them. That means he overthrew them. He overthrew them on our behalf. So anytime we need to overthrow them, it's already been done so we can already operate and walk in it. Okay. See, the problem is you don't realize. All right, so we, we like to talk about, oh, I got the victory because Jesus already got the victory. Well, Jesus got the victory, right, so that you can come in and maintain in the victory. How do you maintain in the victory? Because the same authority that Jesus had when he overthrew the principalities is the same authority that you have to overthrow them. Because since he overthrew them and he is now the head of them, all you got to do is do the same thing your, your, your Savior did. Because they are under the authority. Okay. Okay. So... Let's do this. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Where's my Ephesians? That's my Leviticus. Here's my Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse 17. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. The revelation of Jesus. God is giving us a revelation of our Savior. That even though this may seem foundational, it's still to the point where y'all are not working the strategy. Y'all are not utilizing the authority that you have because you don't fully grasp. Hold on. Sorry. You don't fully grasp how much authority you have actually been hand has actually been handed over to you. God church is saying, oh, we don't, we don't fight against principalities. Well, you know what? I don't have to fight against principality when I already have authority over them. I have to just take authority over the principality. Oh, okay. So, verse 17 says that God wants to give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. And that is what he's doing on tonight with the, the series, The Revelation of Jesus, okay? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. I pray on tonight that your eyes of understanding, understanding has eyes. When your eyes are open, you're able to see. And I pray on tonight that because you understand, you can now see and be enlightened better as it relates to your Savior and the blood, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and with the riches of his glory and with the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. So now you are heirs to the throne, right? So you have God who is the king, you have Jesus who is the prince, and then you have you. And then you have you. And just because we are heirs does not mean we have any less authority. It means we have the ability to tap into the authority of our Father through our Savior. It means we have more power than people have been acting in. 
verse 19. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, Lord? See, we have power who believe, if you believe, according to the working of his mighty power. So we have access to the mighty power of the Father through Christ Jesus. The blood covenant is what gives us access to the Father. It can only be through Christ Jesus. Now you can settle at just, okay, I'm saved and this, that, and the third, and I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus. But there's another level. And that next level is Jesus being the door, the gateway, the access point to you having an intimate one-on-one -on -one relationship with God who created you. You know what it's like? I got four kids. So it's like, and say I adopt one. Instead of coming to me, say I told the kid, you can only come to me if you go to your brother first. Go to your brother first. Go to your brother. Or, you know, you're okay with just stopping at the brother when you can actually have a relationship with the one who adopted you. The blood gave you the ability to be adopted. Uh-oh. But the one who adopted you, the one who sent the transaction for the purchase is saying, now I want you to know me. Don't just stop at the at, at your brother. Don't just stop at the savior. Now come to the one who created you. Now come to your parent. Come to your father. Come to Abba. Now let's develop this relationship so that you can know me now because you have access to me because guess what? Your brother opened the door. Before your brother opened the door, you didn't have access to me. I was on my throne and you was out there. But now your brother knows the steps and the protocol so that you can be righteous and worthy enough to even come into my presence. So if if before you get to me, your brother sees that you're dirty, you stinky, you this, you that, he gonna make sure you get cleaned up first. And until you get cleaned up, whatever message you have for me, you'll relay it through your brother. But the moment you decide to go jump in that shower and the brother sees that, all right, because if you go in there the other way, daddy going to get you, he going to spank you. If you go in there, your shirt torn, daddy going to spank you because he can be like, well, why is your shirt torn? I, then I just buy you a new shirt, da 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 da. Y'all see how that flows? And God is saying, now I'm showing you through your savior, how you can now come in the room with me, how you can now have an audience with me, how you can now sit at my feet, how you can boldly approach my throne of grace so that you can receive mercy. Okay. Let me tell y'all. Verse 20, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Uh-oh, hear this, y'all. Far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things of the church. Listen, verse 21 lists the hierarchy of the angels, whether good or bad. And I'm going to take y'all there in a second. And what the father is saying is that, listen, because I allow Jesus, the prince, to now come into this earth realm, make a spoil over everything that was trying to take authority over you, and gave him authority over them and set him above them. That same authority you have access to because you are in contract. You are in covenant. It is sealed and signed in blood. So that power has been transferred to you. When the Bible says we are seated in heavenly places, right? Who else is seated in heavenly places? Jesus. 
He's at the right hand of the Father. So because of the covenant, we have the ability to come up higher than our foe. See, we keep fighting from ground level. And some of y'all fighting from up under their feet. When they should be up under your feet. You're not fighting from, you're not high enough. See, you can't take authority over something that you're not above. Okay. If you're not ranked above me, you can't take authority over me. My sons and my daughters cannot take authority over me because I'm above them. I'm mama. I created them. Okay. I need y'all to hear me. Y'all got to come up. Y'all fighting from a position lower than where you're supposed to be seated. Y'all fighting from a position lower than where your weapon tree is. Y'all are fighting from a position lower than where your authority lies. And guess what? When you operate in authority, there is no fighting. Uh-oh. When you take authority over something, you decree a thing and so shall it be. You speak a thing and it must submit and obey. Jesus Christ already made a spoil over all of them. So therefore, any victory that they would try to pull over you, they can't because he already hands you the victory the moment you take authority. That's like, if I'm in a fight, or if I'm in a confrontation, okay, and my boss is me and a co-worker, right? Me and a co-worker. And my boss steps on the scene. And my boss is in charge. And my boss says, listen, I'm with you. I give you authority in this situation. Guess what? Now you outrank the co-worker. Whatever the strong argument was, whatever the stronghold was, whatever the confrontation was, is now canceled because guess what? You now have no authority. Because I've been placed in a position of authority because it was transferred to me by the one who's over me. Who is automatically over you. All right, I'm going to bring it on home. I'm going to bring it on home. Listen, listen, listen. Listen, Linda. Come on now. I'm feeling my help now. Y'all know I was tired. So, we're going to go back to the whole... um, powers and dominions and all that stuff in a second right i want y'all to get this so the blood the cross as we say to put this in your notes okay the cross is the altar the cross that they put christ on is representative of the altar the death of jesus was the sacrifice okay the blood of jesus is the covenant now the contract okay that was established by um by the death which was the sacrifice on the altar which was the cross now listen the resurrection is where your authority came in because it was it was in his resurrection that he made the spoil of the principalities and the powers y'all better come on and get what i'm saying and now guess what The ascension is your next level of power because he had to leave so the Holy Spirit could come. And the Holy Spirit is what? The dunamis power of the Father. I'm going to say that again because if y'all can get that, I think think it's going to help y'all where y'all at. The cross is the altar. So whenever you need an altar, you can refer to the cross. You need to pin something to the altar, pin it to the cross. Nail it to the cross. What happens on the cross? Well, the death was the sacrifice, so the blood is on the cross speaking a better testimony, a better witness than Abel's blood. So anything of witchcraft, of uh, of hoodoo, voodoo, doo-doo, any of that stuff, nail it to the cross, allow the blood to speak against it, and blot it out. And then, because of the resurrection, you can now take authority over it. Oh, y'all better stop playing me. This is spiritual warfare at its finest. You can now take authority over it and demolish it by the power of the Holy Spirit because Jesus Christ, his ascension now gave you access 
to the next level of power, which is the Holy Spirit. Oh, if you work it, it'll work. The replays are on. If you work the word, it'll work. Romans 6, verse 8 to 11. Hold on. And then I'm going to go somewhere else with it. Romans 6, where's my Romans? Hold on, y'all. Hold on, y'all. I got to give y'all the word because y'all ain't going to say, I'm not in the word. I'm in the word. Where's my Romans? Hold on. Now. If we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead died no more. Death have no more dominion. We are in dominion. Dominion is a form of power over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. His death, oh, I want y'all to catch this. It is in his death that we got eternal life because without him dying, then the blood wouldn't have been shed and we wouldn't have an atonement. And without the resurrection now, that gives the authority for the blood, which is life to the flesh, to now be dispersed and made accessible to all those who would receive it. Come on, y'all. That is how you have access to eternal life. That is how you have access to eternal life. Now, I know this is good because I didn't set up a little a little higher because I'm going to go here with it. Now, when we talked about angels and demons, when I did that teach, I know it was a while ago. I think it's on the YouTube. It's down to YouTube. We talked about the hierarchy of the angels. And at the highest, you have the seraphims. They're the highest order. They're the first order. Then you have the, ser- you have the cherubims. They're the second order. Then you have thrones. Oh, I know somebody is getting where I'm going. After all we just learned tonight. Then you have thrones, which is the third order. Then you have dominion. Then you have might, which is the the dominions is the fourth order of the angelic hierarchy. Then you have might, which is the fifth order, powers, which is the sixth order, principalities, which is the seventh order, archangels, which is the eighth order, and the lowest orders are the ninth order, which is ministering spirits. I need y'all to get this. Now, if the word of God says, let me go back. I'm going to go back. I got to make sure that y'all are getting where I'm going, that Jesus Christ was set on the right hand above, has power over and authority over all principalities. That's the seventh order. Powers, that's the sixth order. Mights, that's the fifth order. Dominion, that's the fourth order. He's at the throne, seated on the throne, the the, the the right hand of the Father. That's the third order. You know, the cerebrums and cherubims, they're the only ones who, you know, have access to the Father. They, they're around the throne, okay? Um, in his presence, worship him and praising him. And every name that is named, then does that not say that Jesus Christ has been set above any and everything in this earth realm and in the spiritual realm and therefore has authority next to his father so that when you utilize the name of Jesus, when you utilize the authority that you have through the blood covenant of Jesus, when you utilize the contract and the covenant, 
you literally you can't lose you have access to everything you literally have access to everything at your disposal that's why you can be victorious but are you utilizing what's at your disposal are you utilizing what is at your disposal man really think about this thing y'all Yeah, I have a video on YouTube about angels and demons, but I want you to really think about this. So this is why I don't care who the fallen angel is. They don't have more authority than Jesus. I don't care what the demonic power is. I don't care what the demonic principality over a region is. I don't care what the demonic might is or the demonic dominion is. I don't care who the archangel is in the demonic realm. I don't care what ministering spirits of the fallen. I, not, none of them have an authority higher than the savior. And if that authority has been transferred over to you, and this is why they want you to get you in a trick bag, because if you don't realize that you are actually seated higher than them and have more authority than them, and you have access to more power than them, they take advantage of you. They prey on what you don't know, and they prey on your vulnerability. But if ever... You begin to speak and operate. See, I think on tonight, some of y'all need to go nail some things to the cross. Uh-oh. I think on tonight, after this teaching, some of y'all need to go nail some things to the cross. Take authority over. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to go back. You're going to nail it to the cross because Jesus Christ was... The, his death was the sacrifice that shed the blood that is now on the altar, which is the cross, speaking a better uh, testimony and has given you access to the covenant that through the resurrection of God, of Jesus, that you now have authority over all these spirits and fallen angels to command them where to go, what to do, what they're not going to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. Y'all need to go nail some things to cross and let the blood of Jesus speak on your behalf. You got issues at your job? Nail it to the cross. Let the blood of Jesus speak on your behalf. Take authority over every spirit that is attached to whatever the situation is in the name of Jesus. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, break their power. Because Jesus Christ has already made a spoil, so you already speak the victory in that situation. And they can't do nothing about it. So it does not ward off demons, but what it what what it does do is establish the covenant that gives you the authoritative power over them. I pray y'all get that. I don't want to like do too too much because I want y'all to actually be able to to say lie and breathe on what was already shared. But I really pray and hope that. How you maneuver and navigate now begins to shift, okay? Because um, I know for me, it's going to shift. And I want y'all to take a moment to understand that. And I'm going to say this again. And, I, and I'm, I'm working with those in TPR about this now. That's, that writing is, is not just for fun. Writing, scripting, you know, whether in um, print or in cursive, it, it's not just um something to do like writing is a seal it's an inscription okay it's a it's another form of uh activating either the power of god or tapping into demonic powers 
So even in our writing, there must be a carefulness because we are invoking and conjuring with the words on the paper. And we are telling these words that this is the vision that I want you to create in my life. God writes and he inscribes. So don't you think that the enemy has his mimic? So if he can get you to write a vision and to write a story and to write a narrative that could be detrimental to you, instead of writing what God says about you, guess what? You are invoking, you are conjuring, and then when you read it. So when you are writing, you are spelling out words, spell, you're casting a spell. Uh Uh-oh. Am I about to get in trouble? Am I about to get in trouble? So, when you read what you have spelled over and over again, it now becomes an incantation. That is why if you're going to script anything, script the word of God. That is why if you're going to repeat and recite anything, repeat and recite the word of God. Because with every incantation you're conjuring up a spirit if ever spell that you with, with whatever spell that you cast you are conjuring up a spirit a demonic spirit if it's not of god to now come and take that vision and bring it here into this earth realm that is how some books can become movies uh oh i ain't trying to step on no toes i'm leaving